I'm about as real as they come. All my beats tailored by Drew. Maserati Rick in Detroit Convertible bird in Miami Graduated summa cum laude Strip club made a tsunami Carlton Hines with the ball game Grateful Edmonds with the snowflakes Craig Pettis in the M-Town Sal Magluta with the boat game Falcone with the cocaine Like Freeway Ricky with the plug game Like Monster Cody in South Central Larry Davis from Close Range Maserati Rick had a legendary life But he also had a legendary death he was murdered here on the third floor of this hospital that's now Sinai Grace. But 20 years ago when it happened, it was Mount Carmel Hospital. He was recovering here in room 307 after having been shot by a drug rival. And then they came back on September 12, 1988 to finish off the job. No one had ever been murdered inside that hospital. So security measures changed forever at the medical center on Detroit's west side. Officials say two men were seen near his room when the shooting was discovered. Really, we don't have a whole lot of details other than the fact that um, some people saw two men. Anybody can visit patients, and there was no restrictions um, on visiting this patient. There are sometimes restrictions imposed by patients or the police department, etc., and there were no restrictions on this patient. This is the first time in the hospital's 50-year history there has been a shooting inside. Officials say after today, they plan to reevaluate their security measures. A family member who did not want to appear on camera said Carter was shot on Friday while washing his car. She said she spoke to him this morning on the telephone, and he said he couldn't identify who shot him. News of the shooting upset visitors who came to the hospital located at Outer Drive and Schaefer Road. They were banned from visiting patients on the third floor for the rest of the night. How, what, who, or should we know? Because we're security, how does that happen? My father right there. Oh, this is your father's It's right here. Richard Carter Jr. comes to Elmwood Cemetery about once a month to visit the grave of his father, the drug kingpin, Maserati Rick, who ran a multi-million dollar crack cocaine and heroin empire on Detroit's east side. Maserati Rick was known across the country for driving flashy cars, wearing the finest clothes, and the most expensive jewelry, even hanging out with celebrities. So it's ironic that he has such a plain looking grave marker for a man who police say amassed millions of dollars. It's even more ironic when you consider that underneath this simple headstone is this, a $16,000 silver coffin built like a Mercedes-Benz complete with spinning wheels. Most people know your dad as one of Detroit's most notorious drug dealers. Okay, yeah, that's one part, but it's another part, the, you know what I'm saying, how he did good deeds for everybody, you know what I'm saying? You can ask people in the city mm -hmm. how he helped people open up their businesses and just giving out money to what, whoever if they needed it. Mm -hmm. So they ain't really cover that part of the, you know what I'm saying, his life. The Maserati Rick in the headlines was infamous for running such a lucrative drug network and being the target of both local and federal authorities. All oh, this was in the Detroit Armament. So now Rick Jr. is on a crusade to tell what he calls a more complete story of not Maserati Rick, but Richard Carter Sr., husband, father, and humanitarian. He's kept dozens of articles and artifacts, even his father's glasses and other items. He says it makes him angry to read only about what the police and FBI thought of his dad. That's why Rick Jr. has teamed up with the filmmaker and producer to dig into what we did not read in the paper. The two started this project last year chronicling Rick Sr.'s other impact on the community. Maserati Rick story is very, very interesting. Flip Wilson has written, shot, and edited eight documentaries, some about a world that few of us have seen, like prison, drug users, and gangs. Yo, lock them up in the basement and tie them up, you know? And now this, an inside look at one of Detroit's most powerful drug dealers. We've been working on it for like six months now and we found out so many things that are false about the stuff that the news press and you know the street guys are saying mm -hmm. and it's just becoming 
so intense to, to, to research his life. What do you want people to know about your dad? And what do you think is the biggest misconception? Of he wasn't like every, he wasn't like how everybody was trying to say he was, you know what I'm saying? Everybody liked him, smiled a lot. Everywhere he go, he smiled, so, you know what I'm saying? He got along with everybody. He had friends everywhere. This is uh, my father and my mother. The documentary will focus on things we did not know, like the fact that Maserati Rick wanted to be a boxer. So much so that there's a pair of boxing gloves on his tombstone. To us, he's Maserati Rick, but to you, he's dad. Are you proud of your father? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because it's like everything he did, he was trying to, you know, it was for, for the family. Because his dad, as everybody knows, was in the tabloids, Jet Magazine. Everyone covered it in the 80s. So my main goal was to help him get some peace in the world to know the true Maserati rate. Rick Jr. and Flip hope to have the documentary done by his father's birthday, July 31st. Why is it important for you to, for you to tell your father's story? Who else gonna do it? Who else gonna do it? Nobody else gonna do it. In Detroit, Charles Pugh. Only Fox on News. 7 tonight, the campaign to free a woman locked up for two decades is about to pay off. She was hit with a long prison sentence for a non-violent drug crime after a relationship with a high-profile dealer. 7 Action News reporter Simon Shaykhet takes us inside the case that got the attention of the governor. Supporters of criminal justice reform call this a major victory, and they are praising the governor for taking a bold step. My heart will not stop beating fast. <laughs> and just thinking about what I've been waiting for for a long time. Speaking with us by phone from inside state prison, 60-year-old Tracy Cowan is about to be reunited with her children, grandchildren, and soon-to-be great-grandchildren after her mother spent roughly two decades in prison for a nonviolent drug crime. Daughter Rachel Carter is talking only with us about what it means. That'll be something that I know will be an emotional moment for me, an emotional moment for her, and that's just something like that's the best Christmas present I could have ever got. Like, I don't want anything else but that. Having already lost her father, known throughout Detroit as Maserati Rick, Rachel says their family has prayed for this commutation, now granted by the governor. And her mother is also eager to start a new life helping others. I want to be able to open up a domestic violence shelter. You take someone that was involved in a nonviolent crime, a woman, albeit, that, that has never committed an act of violence in her life, you know, and to spend two decades of her life away from her children, I mean, I just have a problem with that. Rick Wershey Jr., known as White Boy Rick, also served more than 32 years for a nonviolent drug crime. Now an advocate for prison reform, he and others who believe in this pushed for Cowan's release. That was where my brand, The Eighth, came from, you know, which touches on your Eighth Amendment, the ban on cruel and unusual punishment, excessive bail. The governor, she, she did the right thing. She made the right decision. Uh, Tanisha Yancey, a state representative, uh, Sherry Gay Dinago is a friend of hers, and, and we all work together and, and team wellness. And today, the feelings of joy are very real for a reunion expected to happen soon. They called me today and they cried, and, and I cried a little bit with them. I want to thank Rick Wershey. I definitely want to thank Representative Yancey and most importantly, Governor Whitman. She was the one that made the ultimate decision to bring my mother home. Now, Tracy's family hopes that she'll be able to come home in 30 to 60 days. In the meantime, those supporters for criminal justice reform say they plan to continue advocating for others. Simon Shaykat, 7 Action News. Yo, yo, we back. It's your boy, Popolai. Mob, mob, mob. We headed to the D with it. Y'all meet us on the east side. West 7 Mile to be exact. Whole lot of gangster shit going on around these parts. Now today we are going to be covering a person that some people went on to call the Motor City King of Crack. Like his nickname wasn't fly enough. And the person that I'm talking about today is going to be a guy by the name of Richard Carter. But let's be honest, we all want to call him the world-renowned Maserati Rick. Now, we can't start the story off talking about Maserati Rick without talking about Detroit. Predominantly the east side. I heard some of my guys from Detroit actually say, you can tell which side somebody is from in the city by how they dress, how they talk, and how they act. 
anybody from Detroit, y'all get in the comment box and y'all explain that because they don't understand. Now, when we talk about Detroit as a whole, before I zone in on the east side, during the crack era, it was just a haven for hustlers because you're going to have infamous names like the Chambers Brothers, Johnny Curry and his brothers, the best friends, even organizations like Pony Down. But a lot of it started with one specific organization and almost one guy. And it was a guy by the name of Butch Jones. And he started an organization by the name of YBI Young Boys Incorporated. Now, Maserati Rick's story is kind of tied to theirs because when that organization was indicted and removed off the streets, it left a huge vacuum. And based on all my research, they're going to say Maserati Rick and his partner at the time, Demetrius Holloway, was right there to absorb all of that space. And they would go on to take bits and pieces of the east side during that drug trade. Although his career would get started by stealing cars. Now, he was born on July 31st, 1959 in the city of Detroit. And by all accounts, it looks like he spent a majority of his early life in Detroit. As far as what he was into as a young boy, that's not really documented. But it was said that he first came to the attention of law enforcement authorities at the age of 18 when he was convicted for receiving stolen property. Now, during the course of doing mob ties, I found out that it's like almost a mystery to find out where crack first hit, what time it first hit. But one thing I can say for sure that by 19 mid eighties, it was in all of the big cities in Detroit being one of those big cities. And it would be right around that time in 1982, when Maserati Rick and his good friend at the time, Demetrius Holloway, would catch a break. I talked a little bit earlier about YBI and how they had semi-control over the east side. So when a guy by the name of Sylvester Seal Murray was convicted in 1982, that left a hole because he was pretty much one of those suppliers to that YBI organization. And it's going to say from that time in 1982, to 1985, in those three short years in the crack game, Maserati Rick controlled one of the most prominent organizations that was operating on the east side of Detroit. And in a lot of episodes, I try to put it into perspective to what crack did to families. I always looked at it like crack was the best thing and the worst thing that happened to some people and sometimes it was both because I talked with countless hustlers and they talk about the shift when the game went from selling powder to when crack rolled into town and when they begin to talk about the money that was flowing around at that time you could almost see the hearts in their eyes over the phone so it was in that very short period of time 1982 to 1985, where Maserati Rick really, really, really made a name for himself. And a lot of talk is mentioned on how did he get the name Maserati Rick? Was he always in a Maserati? From my understanding, he had a fleet of cars. And it's a lot of different stories on how he got the name. But one thing we can say is the name fit. Now, during the course of my research, I did see that he had a relationship with White Boy Rick. And I even read some places where they said White Boy Rick might have been his supplier. But I could not put a definite finger on that. But just like the questions of where he was getting that supply that he was able to serve on the east side. Another thing a lot of people do didn't know about Maserati Rick was he was heavily into boxing and he actually boxed for a little while. You can see him in pictures with Don King, Sugar Ray Leonard. I spoke with his son on numerous occasions and he has a lot of the artifacts and you can even shop with him at Maserati Rick Collections on Instagram. And he talked about his father's boxing gloves that he was still in possession of. 
and just a lot of different things that kind of opened my eyes to how much Maserati Rick was into boxing. But by all indications, that was his second love because with his success in the crack game, it was said that eventually he got into heroin and he took off even further and he was able to expand his network of operation. And it was said that federal agents often took notes of him taking trips to Florida and Los Angeles while they surveilled him trying to find a constant source of supply for the heroin. And a lot of people would say that the evidence of the money that he was making would be in his luxury homes and the many businesses that he owned. He was said to own a bungalow on Berkwood Avenue, as well as a fortified flat near Alter Road in East Jefferson. And it was even rumored that he owned a luxury riverfront condo. So he definitely was getting money. And by all accounts, that's where the businesses came to play because they said that he owned several hair salons as well as a couple car washes. And when you do as much research as I have and you look at the story in totality, some might say that those businesses was the beginning of the downfall for Maserati Rick because he would end up being shot and wounded at one of these car washes that he owned it in mid-September 1988. And it would be from there where assassins would essentially track him down to room 307 at Mount Carmel Hospital just two days after he had been shot. But that's essentially where the mystery and the life of Maserati Rick begins because at the time of his death, Maserati Rick had been feuding with his one-time best friend, Demetrius Holloway, as well as going through an on-standing beef with Ed, Big Ed Hansard. Now, not quite sure what the beef with Demetrius Holloway was, but when you're in the drug business, 10 times out of 10, it's over money. And when I did research on the beef with Ed Hansard, I seen somewhere where it might have had something to do with the $2,500 bet over a beauty salon, but it's hard for me to think that Maserati Rick would have died over $2,500. So, like I said, that's where the mystery begins. But this is a story that was long overdue. I know it took me a minute to get to. I'm sure y'all heard it. But this is Mob Ties, the Encyclopedia for Gangsters, and we gonna make sure every real one story get told. Y'all make sure y'all follow me on Instagram, on Twitter, P-O-P underscore A underscore L-O-T. Y'all get in the comment box below. Let me know what cities we need to go to, what stories we missed, what gangsters we haven't covered. And y'all hit the red subscribe right under this video so y'all know when this real trill spill shit is dropping. And y'all make sure y'all go shop with Maserati Rick Jr., at Maserati Rick Collections on Instagram. Y'all tell them Papa Lot sent you. Mob, mob, mob.